all questions. For any additional question that you feel is not um, answered during the presentation, you can email us at bugshop at nola.gov and we'll get to your question. We'll also be posting the webinar on our website, which is www.nola.gov forward slash mosquito. Today's topic once again is integrated pest and rodent management, which is a comprehensive look at the strategies used for rodent control. Today we have two people presenting, presenting I should say, Dr. Claudia Rigo and Timothy Madeir. Dr. Rigo is the director here at Mosquito Termite and Rodent Control Board. She earned her degrees from Purdue University, the University of Georgia, and obtained a PhD from the University of Florida. In 2004, she became principal research entomologist for the City of New Orleans Mosquito Termite and Rodent Control Board. In 2006, she became the assistant director, and in 2010, she was promoted to director of the department. At the city, she provides technical support for the City of New Orleans and the pest control industry, conducts independent research, collaborates with industry for enhancements of existing products and testing of new products, and collaborates with government organizations and universities on a variety of research projects involving rodents, mosquitoes, termites, and a variety of other urban pests. Timmy Madeir began his career in the pest control industry very early in life, working with his grandfather's pest control comp company every summer. While in college, he drove mosquito trucks at night in his hometown of Laplace, Louisiana. In 2003, he went on to work for Terminex as a general pest control specialist for five years. And in 2008, he came to work for the City of New Orleans Mosquito Rodent and Termite Control Board as a general pest control specialist and a research assistant and currently is still working with us as our special projects coordinator. Timmy has worked on research studies and urban pest issues concerning everything from termites to bed bugs to coyotes and raccoons, but his primary focus is on the rodents and urban rodent control. Timmy has written articles of rodent biology and control techniques for the National Wildlife Control Operator Association and PCT Magazine, as well as being featured a featured speaker in 2015, 16, and 2017 for PCT Magazine's annual rodent control webinar. Timmy has a BA in history from the University of New Orleans. First up, we have Dr. Regal. Thank you so much for taking the time today. So just a little bit of information about our organization. Um, so, uh, of course, we were part of the City of New Orleans Mosquito Termite and Rodent Control Board. We were established many years ago in 1964 to do mosquito work. Um, but the city also had a rodent control program that fell at the time uh, underneath the health department. So back in the 90s, the rodent control and mosquito control were merged. But you can see that we do the rodent abatement for Orleans Parish. We have uh, quite a bit of mosquito control work as well. We do uh, termite work in city and government buildings, as well as a lot of education and training. So um, there are a lot of flyers out there, brochures about all these different topics, but we do, we host uh, mosquito academies. Uh, we also do a lot of the training for the pest control industry. We attend garden shows and all of that. We, all, uh, we also started two years ago, Bug Fest, Anola Bug Fest. And now with this, we're starting our webinar series uh, because of the restrictions with COVID-19. But today, thank you for joining us for our second installment. And we're really going to talk a lot about rodent integrated pest management. So I think many of you have heard that word, IPM, right? Integrated pest management. But we're going to really focus on rodent today. So the very first step of any rodent control program is really to know your, I call it here, your enemy, right? So is it uh, what kind of rat do you have or what kind of mouse do you have? These animals live in very crowded uh, environments and they can disperse, right? They can go up to 500 feet as part of, part of the range of an average rodent uh, Norway rat host range. Um, they'll primarily outside here, but yes, some of these animals do get inside if it's a roof rat in our attics, 
um, are, are also in our homes. Uh, they don't hibernate, it's not very cold here. And of course, they're gonna wanna stay around your their food and their water. So very important so they don't have to travel far. Um, rats need to drink water every day, but mice don't. And so, but they do a very good job of finding it. As far as when they're most active, it really depends on the environment, but typically at dawn and dusk, you're gonna see these animals move around quite a bit. So the animals that we're gonna focus on primarily uh, for our series of presentations are gonna be the commensal rodents. So these animals that are sharing our table is what we say. And so they are exploiting our resources. And for us in our area, it's the house mouse, the Norway rat and the roof rat. Just a few photographs so that you're able to identify these animals. So the Norway rat is on top. It's quite a robust animal. If they reach a pound, that's a very large rat, okay? They're never gonna be as large as a cat. As, as a cat. They will um, puff up their fur so it does look like um, they're larger than they really are when they're threatened. The bottom picture is the roof rat. It's a bit more petite. It's a very long, it has a very long tail. So the, the length of the tail is longer than the length of the body. If you really wanna learn more about the biology and anatomy of these animals, please visit our website and look at the very first installment and it'll provide a lot more specific information. So how do these animals get in, right? So they just need a very small hole. So we use uh, the size of a, about an inch, it's a quarter uh, in diameter. So if you have a hole that is that big, that animal will squeeze through. So they don't need much uh, to, to feed on, of course, a very little amount of food. Um, and I said already, they're gonna try to nest close to their food and water, um, places where they already have everything abundant. And that's what we're gonna work on is to remove all those conducive conditions so that we don't have a rodent problem to begin with. Here's a photograph of a house mouse just to give, there's a penny there, so it gives you an idea of the size. They're, they're quite small. And again, they may look a little larger if they're um, sort of puff up a little bit their fur, uh, but typically, again, very small. With the mice, we use a dime as our sort of indicator. So you want to close all your holes uh, smaller or larger than a dime. Next uh, installment, we're going to spend a whole hour on pest proofing so that everybody's going to have some great tips on what you can do to keep these rodents out of your house or out of that structure. And again, refer back to our first webinar. It has a lot of information about the basic biology. So what are we concerned about with the urban rodent problem? So of course, contamination of food, very important. It may be you know, in a silo full of uh, grain. It may be in a restaurant. It may even be in your pantry. So these animals are urinating and defecating all over. Um, and so it's, you know, it's definitely contamination of food. Uh, we also have seen quite a bit of gnawing and destruction to wires and even um, uh, containers or underneath a door where they'll actually gnaw at the door to open up that opening. There have been some locations that so many burrows were underneath a sidewalk that it had actually cracked. Every single animal that you come across, you should assume it is carrying a pathogen. A lot of work has been done, not only here in New Orleans, but across the country, Vancouver, Baltimore, New York City, and it keeps on going, if you look, you will find. And that's what we're, we're really finding in these uh, animals. The pathogens are there. And of course, nobody wants a bad PR for a city. I don't want visitors coming to New Orleans and looking at a rat or seeing one on a wire or you know, hopefully never in a restaurant or in a, in a home. So it's not a good thing for cities to have that reputation. All right. So let's talk about integrated pest management. So this is really the topic of today. And so what is IPM? It's used so many different ways in so many different fields, uh, from agriculture to schools, a mosquito control IPM, we do that as well, in pest control. So I want every, turf and ornamental. So I want everybody to really have a good understanding of what this means and it can be applied to these different disciplines. So typically, um, there's going to be five steps for an IPM program. 
first, as I mentioned, you have to do a really good inspection. So, and it doesn't matter if you're inspecting for cockroaches or rodents or thrips or, or anything. And you have to make sure you know what you're dealing with, right? So we just, I just showed know your enemy, identify what you're dealing with, especially let's say ants, right? Um, you may treat one ant a certain way and a different ant completely in a different way. Um, establish your thresholds of uh, concern of when you would implement a type of control. Well, when it comes to rodents, if you see one, you're probably going to do something about it. So very important to understand. And then what we try to do is to deploy or employ at least two or more measures. Um, I usually use the IPM triangle. So it's got food, harborage, and water. And I want to kick out, break two of those sides and it's really going to help you gain control. And part of it, too, is to evaluate the effectiveness of what you are doing. And so we're going to cover much of this today. And so again, you know, when we look at this, it's really a common sense type of control. It's not saying that we don't like to use pesticides or um, and that's not going to be in the program. No, that probably will be in the program, but that should really be your last resort. Very important. So we're really taking that holistic approach um, to solving those pest issues. So pest professionals that are out there, we have lots of pest professionals in our market. Um, they're going to use some of those IPM techniques. Of course, not just only pesticides, but they may turn off your hose pipe and you know, maybe flip over that container if you have uh, mosquitoes or something, um, you know, like that. It may even re be removing that food source. If you're leaving your pet food outside all the time, they're going to say, please take that out. If you want more information, you can go to uh, pestworld.org. They have a lot of great information that's available to the public as well as the pest management industry. So again, I'm going to keep harping on this point, but let's just talk about it one more time in a, in a bit of a different way, right? But all of this has to be based on science and you have to make good decisions based on what you are seeing with your pest, what kind of thresholds you're finding, uh, what options do you have? So it's very important to look at that information. What we really haven't mentioned so far is education. And we're gonna talk a little bit about it. I'm gonna break that out today, but we, and, and thank you for being on this webinar because this is the first step, is really educating folks on the biology. What are your options? What happens with conducive conditions? So we have to put all, that all together so that um, everybody can work together. It has to be a two-way street where the consumer, the customer, is working with the person actually administering control. All right, so again, it's almost like a cycle, a circle, uh, and we are gonna keep going around and around. And you obviously you have to communicate, you have to inspect and identify, we might take some action and evaluate um, how well our actions have actually uh, performed, right? And if we're continuing to have issues, what changes in, in the strategy or new implementations that we need to do. So we're going to go and say, uh, call it moving forward as uh, integrated rodent management. All right, so he, these are some of the basic strategies, right? It's all pretty common sense type things, but we're going to focus on education, inspections and surveillance, sanitation. So that's my favorite one. When it comes to rodent control, Rodent control actually is sanitation. That is just hand in hand. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about exclusion, but again, the next webinar, we're gonna spend an entire hour on pest proofing because we think it is so important. So that's just um, primarily next week. And then really give you guys some basic information about trapping so that you're able to trap yourself if you're interested. And we wanna give you some basics of rodenticides so that you're aware on how they work and what's available through the pest, uh, pest management industry. All right, so let's talk about public education. So this is just a photograph. Uh, a couple of years ago, we started a, a wildlife and rodent academy. So it's three days, all rodents and wildlife. And so why do we do that? It's to help educate and provide information to homeowners, of course, but really to the pest control industry. So 
all these pest control professionals are in people's yards. Uh, they've got customers. So we're working together with them so that we can make sure we're managing our pest issues. And there is a lot of information from brochures to handouts. There's actually a, a, in your chat box, the Centers for Disease Control actually has an excellent IPM manual. Everybody should look at it. But we also have some new brochures that we've put out and this is really targeted to the homeowner. And so just reminding folks about your garbage cans and your pet food and the bird seed and the water, because everybody's busy. I'm busy, you know, I work all day and then you have to take care of the kids and then there's soccer and whatever it may be. And then all of a sudden people aren't spending as much time outside, you forget. So I always say with this type of thing is pick a day, one day a week and just walk five minutes around your yard and look for the standing water, the bird food, all that business that can be essentially a conducive condition. Um, something interesting and new that we are doing this year is uh, brand new brochures on dumpster management. So we're also targeting the education to our business owners in our community. So really explaining what are the rules um, so we actually, the, there's the brochure and then we have a magnet that we actually are going to put onto that dumpster itself. We also worked with enforcement bodies. If it's the state health department or our sanitation department, they do a great job of getting out there and doing inspections as well. But it's just those reminders of how sanitation is so important for rodent prevention. All right. So there's, like I said, there's lots of different options for education, especially going online now. There's, there's webinars like this, but there's additional ones out there as well. So for anybody from the homeowner to the pest management industry, inspections are key. If you don't do a good inspection, you're going to miss it. You know, these animals leave clues behind. And actually uh, you'll see uh, Timmy right there looking at the drop ceiling and you see that dark area right next to him. That's a that, that's sebum. So that's an area that rodents have been utilizing up and down and up and down and have left the sebum onto that surface. So it gives us a good idea that we need to be looking in that drop ceiling. So let's talk a little bit about inspections. Again, must do a thorough inspection and that can be your home. You have to get in that attic or get underneath that house. Um, or in that commercial property. Don't forget about those drop ceilings. So take the tools that you need. Typically, it's gonna be a flashlight. You can see we're wearing gloves, things like that. Very important. What we do at the city of New Orleans is we also look at green space. So a lot of parks and the neutral grounds, right? Medians, very important. We look at the riverfront, uh, public and privately owned structures. So if you're in Orleans Parish, you can call 311 and file a service request. If you see any kind of rodent issues and we'll send an inspector out, we'll take a look at your property and see if there's anything we can do and provide some suggestions, especially on some of those conducive conditions. We also handle all of our city owned facilities. Um, so there are over 300 city buildings and we do a lot of those inspections and manage the pest issues on those properties. These are just some examples of burrows uh, right at the base of some a tree uh, right at the edge of that concrete. Um, you can see the burrows that are going in under. And again, we talked a little bit about con uh, conducive conditions. We're going to talk about uh, garbage cans here in a little bit, but this is a little bit of an older photograph. These uh, garbage cans have changed on the riverfront. Now they're all closed systems. But the Baroda burrows is what you're wanting to look for in these green spaces. So not very far from their food source. This is just basic equipment that everybody should have, right? And it's, and it's very basic. It's uh, your flashlight. And now telephones have flashlights, but you want to get, a, you know, something that's pretty strong um, so that you can look for footprints, you know, paw prints and um, other uh, droppings, other things that uh, these animals are leaving behind as clues. Uh, typically a little pry bar of some sort or something that you can probe into 
And when it comes to rotating control, if you're not getting down on your knees, you're probably not doing the job, right? And of course, we always want to wear the appropriate PPE. These are gloves that we're showing, but if you're going to be in an attic or closed system, you definitely need to be wearing uh, the appropriate face covering, typically an N95 respirator, so that you're not exposed to any pathogens that may be in those rodent droppings or in the rodent urine. So you need to know where to look. And so think about it as, you know, being a detective. And so again, you've listened to module one, you know what all of those different clues are that are, le le are left behind and use your tools to really go in and look. You, and also I will say, you could have every tool in the book uh, you know, that is out there, but if you're really not paying attention and that's really using your eyes and your ears and your nose because these animals will leave a particular odor behind and you're really moving things along you know, in that space, you're probably going to miss it. The other thing that makes inspections often challenging is that every single job is different and it is unique and it's really important that a very thorough investigation is done. So it may require that you look for the building plans or have an understanding of what these, um, you know, what these, uh, your structure really looks like. Very important, but be a detective, take the time. And again, this may be your own home or that business or structure or even outside. So where do we even look? When it comes to rodents, you have to think about three dimensional. If you're just looking down at the ground, you're going to miss them. You need to look up, you have to look at behind, you have to look at that corner that is really, you maybe never, let's say you're in your garage and there's boxes piled up all the way in the corner and hasn't been moved for a couple of years, that's where you need to be looking. So in those shadows, um, so look at the linear lines, look at the corners, look at the clutter, uh, water sources and food sources, appliances, right? So if you have, um, you know, these animals lose a lot of body heat quickly. So your water heaters, your refrigerator, the a dishwasher, washer and dryer, those are places that you need to look under, possibly even pull them out and look for any holes that might be out there or any droppings. Even furniture, we've seen them uh, get in, in furniture. Uh, cabinet voids, and so you can see here that there are a lot of places that you need to be looking in. And so those secluded corners underneath cabinets, those places are kind of quiet, um, very, very important to look. And you can see here, just as a reference, uh, the, the house mouse is actually quite small. So with Norway rats, um, you know, a lot of cases there, we're also looking outside. And so it's underneath the wood piles. If you are feeding your pets outside and leaving that food out, that's a place you need to be looking because the food, pet food is a very good food source and they will absolutely exploit that, that um, the food that is there. Uh, the other place that we see often are gonna be in sheds in the backyard. So just make sure your shed is closed tightly, uh, even underneath, pretty important. But underneath slabs and voids, and they will get into sewer systems, especially if the lines are broken. With roof rats, you must look up. These are arboreal uh, type animals. They like to hang out in trees. Those are the ones that you'll often see on the wires, electrical wires running across. So look up and they will get into uh, your attic. Um, and so look for those openings, any kind of opening penetration that's around your roof. That's a great place to go in. Drop ceilings, you know about already, but in overgrown vegetation. So cut all that away from your structure because it's just a bridge for them to go in. All right, so we, we call these a lot of locations pest vulnerable areas, PVAs. And so these are areas that it would be likely to find these animals because everything they need is there. So how do you, the first step that you must take is on any structure is let's walk around the exterior. Take a look, make a note of the rodent sign. So you see that picture in the middle with the rub mark on that pipe? That's exactly, it is running on that pipe. 
and going into that open window that's in that, I believe that's a school. So very important, look for those signs and also look for the conducive conditions. I put a tire here because that's the perfect environment for holding water. So that's a water source for those animals. Please don't forget about the fruit that is out in the environment. I mean, Louisiana is fantastic for citrus and many of these citrus trees will just get decimated by roof rats. Uh, they go for the fruit. Oftentimes they'll eat the rind and leave the fruit. So it just very much depends on that population of rodents. And don't forget about our banana trees. So it's a very dense, uh, meaning lots of vegetation and lush, but there's your food source right there for those animals. So you need to make sure that you're cutting it and cleaning up that area. Please don't forget about your palm trees. Those two provide a lot of food for these animals. There's uh, Timmy holding a nut, one of the fruit that came from that tree, and it was already chewed on by rodents. And so, you know, it gets pretty complex, right, for their food source. All right, so if you're an animal feeder, okay, please don't do that. And so feeding the animals outside, and that includes birds in the bird feeders. Uh, if you're feeding your pets outside and you're leaving that food unattended, I can guarantee you, you're going to have visitors and probably a lot of them. We have spoken to many people. I personally have spoken to many people about their bird feeders. And so I too love the birds, they're awesome. I have actually a backyard full of birds, uh, but I don't feed the birds. And so that bird food is just a high nutrient, excellent food source for these rats to be hanging around in your yard. And inevitably, they're going to make their way up into your attic. And so I love it and I'm sorry, but that's really the best practice is not to feed those birds. And if you're feeding your pet outside, again, not only rats, but we're talking raccoons and also possums, you're gonna have other visitors that are gonna be in your yard. And so we don't want any diseases to be transmitted to your pets, right? Very, very important. So anyway, you can train your pets to eat during the time that you leave the food there. So don't leave it overnight, leave it for a predetermined amount of time, train your animals to eat, and then please pull it up and um, you know go on with your day. All right, so let's do, let's talk a little bit about uh, interior inspection. So when you're starting with the interior, you wanna look at the periphery of that building. So you wanna look at your doors and your windows. A lot of buildings have gaps and, or you may even leave your, your door propped open. And so that's an issue. I mean, I love it too. Actually, today happens to be a beautiful day in Louisiana, perfect temperature. I absolutely wanna prop open my doors, but that's a place where frankly, these animals will just walk on in. So get some screens on your doors, sort of prevent them from coming in. You wanna work from the ground up, so there are a lot of properties that have, especially our residential ones that have transoms that are almost always open. So just be careful about what is left open in any damage, uh, also plumbing penetrations, things like that. So inspect your lines, very, very important. Uh, don't forget about storage and utility closets. Anything that is warm, very important. Your freezers, right, it's putting off heat all the time. And of course your pantry, because that's where the food sources are. So, um, and just make sure you're taking good notes and pictures, always very helpful for that documentation. Actually, this happens to be in a commercial property, but you have to look underneath things and you have to look at behind things because that's where potentially they are. So you can see here, our inspector's got a flashlight. She's looking under, she's got her knee pads on, guy has her gloves on very important to do that very thorough inspection because sometimes maybe it's just an apple fell um, or some food crumbs were are, are lodged underneath your refrigerator that's enough to sustain rodents now these are awful photographs right but unfortunately sometimes we see this and that is completely unacceptable so clean 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 right has to be really clean 
And of course, we work with those property owners to say, hey, this is not acceptable. This needs to be cleaned. And so this is actually a violation of the public um, the code, a uh, sanitary code for the state of Louisiana. So we often will get health inspectors involved as well. Now, um, I also um, have, we work very um, closely here with some of our folks, but we use game cameras all the time. So game cameras are very common. Uh, they're not very expensive. And so this is a great way to photograph what may be happening in and around your yard. You can't be up 24 seven looking at, um, you know, doing inspections, but these are your often your eyes when you're not around. Very important. So it's a great tool. And now there's some fancy ones that will actually uh, download or send photographs right to your camera. So it's pretty great. All right, so let's talk a little bit about rodent surveillance. And so many years ago, like many rodent control programs throughout the United States, especially in the in the state health departments, uh, there used to be money for ongoing surveillance of disease. And unfortunately, many of these programs, those budgets have been cut and it's really a tragic situation. So it's very important, right? So we do a lot. A great example for us is that we do uh, a lot of surveillance for mosquito control and also West Nile disease and some of these other arboviral diseases. So Louisiana has one of the best programs in the whole country as it pertains to mosquito control and surveillance, right? But not too many people in the country are doing regular surveillance of rodents and also rodent uh, disease. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between a survey and doing surveillance, right? So survey is a one-time gathering of information. So you're really trying to get that information so you can make an assessment of what is happening. So very, very important, right? It definitely has its role. You get some great information and we're going to give you, I'm going to give you some examples. But surveillance, that is ongoing, continuing, right? Every single week or every month or quarterly, whatever it may be, but it's a process to monitor the changes. And I put here mosquito control because that's what we're doing. But I want to change that to rodent control for the city of New for the city of New Orleans, and we are moving in that direction. But it's going to indicate when control measures are needed and where you know we're being effective or not. And so, in some cases, for mosquito control, we're even looking at resistance. Uh, some of these pesticides, and we're fortunate here for some of our species of mosquitoes, we don't have much of a resistance issue. However, we really don't have any information on resistance to some of these products with rodents, and we're again, we'll be moving to that direction. I do want to give a plug to one of our colleagues and, and actually friend, Dr. Neve Quinn out of California, and she is doing a great survey uh, to update the range map of the roof rat. So I put the website here for you because we have roof rats in our area. So please take the time. If you see one, um, please you know, update that information for her. We will also be giving her data as well. But anyway, there's a website if you want to learn more about it. Now, part of doing some of the surveillance, right, is looking at our 311 service requests. So we have been uh, during after Hurricane, well, Hurricane Katrina wiped out it absolutely destroyed the rodent control building that was in the upper part of the ninth ward in 2005. So we lost a lot of records, unfortunately, because at the time it was mostly paper. But we started immediately um, gathering information on rodent service requests right after Hurricane Katrina. And we've been tracking it all these years. And so we're able to look at clusters of activity or where should we spend, be spending more time? So I just picked a point in time of 2010. Actually, our service requests have been going down over the years, but this happens to be one of them. For that particular year, we had 805 calls from the public um, and only 87 of those actually had rodent activity on the property. Now, again, we have roof rats and we have Norway rats. So we're really talking about burrows that we found with Norway rats, but it just gives you an idea. And so it's another way of representing that data. Here's another way to represent the data is 2017. 
And so we can also look by census block. Um, you can look at uh, housing and population density. There's all different ways of looking at the data to help you figure out where should you be spending your time or where are some of those problem locations. And so again, if it's a, a white block, that means there were no rodent calls that came in from that area. And the darker the block, uh, the darkest one is from eight to 15 calls in that particular area. So those are areas that we need to figure out what's going on and how do we decrease those numbers of uh, service requests. Now, a few years ago, we were working with a professor, Dr. Mike Blum from Tulane University. He's currently now at University of Tennessee, but we continue to work together. And he was able to get a quite a large grant uh, to look at a lot of different factors, um, basically a disturbed environment, uh, which was the case in New Orleans because 80% of the city was flooded. So of course they looked at vegetation, but what was so exciting is that they used rodents as the key indicator species um, that they wanted to look at. So you can see quite a bit of folks on this particular grant all over the place, uh, lots of cooperation, and that cooperation continues to today. And so this is really rodent surveillance. And so looking at species across New Orleans, this happens to be one slice in time in 2016, but there were two yearly trappings and that went on for four years. And so here's a map in red are the Norway rats that were collected, blue uh, roof rats, and the larger the circle, the more rats that were caught. Now, the areas that are bounded in yellow were the areas uh, that were included in the study. So this was quite a big project. And what's really great to see here is that in some parts of the city, we actually have multiple species using the same areas. And other parts of the city, if you look at more towards like Pontchartrain, it's roof rat country. So that is the predominant species of, of rat that's in those particular areas. And it's often quite a challenge, uh, to be honest. All right, so that project also allowed for surveillance of some of these pathogens. And in this particular case, uh, we're looking at Leptospira. So it's a bacterial disease often in the urine. There's a publication, um, Anna P Dr. Anna Peterson wrote the, the publication. You can welcome to, to go and collect and read more about it. But there's a whole series of disease, uh, basically pathogens that were discovered on our rodents. Our fourth installment of this webinar is gonna be focused on that information. So it's really gonna be an exciting one. All right. And then what we're also doing is we were awarded a Centers for Disease Control grant just in September of this year. It's a five year project and the whole goal for the first year is to work across disciplines. So this is the pest management industry, vector management. Um, it is all kinds of folks uh, to look at what data is available there. And so we want to understand the data that's there. What are the gaps? And we're going to move to creating an actual rodent surveillance system. And that's what we're going to use. That's what other folks sort of in our area that do control, they will have the ability to tap into that information. So we're, you know, not working in silos and able to best utilize our resources and be effective. Now, I love talking about sanitation. All right. So, yes, I clean all the time. So that is <laughs> that's, you know, what I do. But sanitation is key to rodent control. So there, of course, is a, an example of a completely unacceptable dumpster, right? So that is just ca a calling card for these animals to come and eat. Now, we've spent a lot of time, so it's uh, November of 2020, so a lot of work has been done since the, the pandemic has started. And I just absolutely love this cartoon because it talks about how clean Bourbon Street is. And in fact, it really is. A lot of effort has gone into dealing with trash and improving some of the conditions. And again, very exciting is improving the infrastructure. Almost all of Bourbon Street has been redone. That's the sidewalks underneath. So that it's everything is clean. So yeah, it's putting a lot of stress on those rats. And so if more stress on those rats is gonna limit the populations and it's gonna help us along with our pest management professional, professionals help expedite the control of the rodents that are still um, maybe there. 
And again, back to the dumpsters, right? So we're working with the state health department, working with the sanitation rangers, ourselves, and we're on dumpster patrol. So if you have a dumpster that is not following the rules, we're, well, we're out there and we're letting uh, the right people know so the correct education and enforcement, uh, if necessary, can be done. Some examples here are the open uh, waste cans. It's very common throughout cities. It's a much more economical uh, avenue to go down. But over the many years, the city of New Orleans has been moving to these closed garbage can systems. And of course, what that does is it, it eliminates the possibility of those rats going and feeding. Because when you have an open garbage can, they will go in and feed from what's inside. So very important to think about the infrastructure of cities and what is being used um, and try to work those uh, bits of information in and those new uh, garbage cans or whatever it may be into decisions uh, from other agencies as well. Now, in 2007, this was really great for New Orleans, is that we went from the open, just regular garbage cans from the residences, uh, residential cans to closed uh, cans. So the city actually issued the roll carts. I put this specific picture here because if you're at your house and you have a garbage can, of course, it can be a roll cart, which is what you'll have. But if the garbage is overflowing, rats still have access to it. So make sure that those cans are closed um, all the time. And they do a great job of eliminating or at least reducing the available food to those animals. And again, if you're inside of a building, make sure it's clean. And look, it's very difficult, right? To clean, clean, clean all the time, but it's really important to keep that trash can covered. Here's an example of a trash can that was next to a vending machine. Well, in this particular case, the mice um, actually pushed in a cork from the back of that vending machine and they went in and it was a buffet of um, chocolate and chips or whatever else was in that vending machine. But look, clutter counts as well. So make sure that things are off the ground. This is not a great example, but you know, if you're not using it, donate it, eliminate it, do whatever you need to do to get rid of it so that you don't have standing clutter. And in that particular case from the vending machine, you can actually see the gnaw marks, see the arrow pointing to the gnaw marks. And that was an active vending machine. So we really had to tell everybody, please stop. Do not, you know, take anything from here. It needs to be cleaned. And so finally, the situation was resolved. But this can be one of the consequences of, of sanitation, poor sanitation. And again, agencies work together at the city of New Orleans all the time. If it's the state health department, sanitation, code enforcement, parks and parkways, uh, everybody is working together so that we can make sure that folks are, you know, really getting the message of clean. This is not acceptable. Um, this needs to be remediated immediately. So very, very important. All right, so we're going to do a little bit of shift here. So uh, Timmy's going to get on the line and he's going to talk a lot about how do you reduce the population of rodents through trapping and also through the use of rodenticides. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, so, yeah, as Claudia said, we're going to talk about trapping today. So let's jump right into it. Uh, I guess I'm going to have to go to mine and go through mine. Does that work? Can everyone see my PowerPoint? Yeah, I can see the bait options, Timmy. It, did it, uh, is it advancing slides now or no? It was. Uh, not anymore? No. Okay, hold on one second. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Okay. Okay, sorry about that, everybody. Okay, technical difficulties aside, let's jump into this. Okay, uh, this is gonna be a basic quick guide for teaching homeowners how to trap yourself at home. Uh, guys, it's it's not as hard as people would, would think. Uh, it takes a lot of practice, but once you learn a little tricks to it, trapping is very easy and very effective. In fact, when you combine sanitation, exclusion, and trapping, 
you you can greatly limit your reliance on rodenticides. Uh, I am definitely in no way, shape, or form opposed to rodenticides. I couldn't imagine a world where we didn't have access to them. It would make our jobs impossible, especially when you do it on a large scale like we do for a city. But for a small scale for houses, trapping uh, exclusion, uh, sanitation and trapping are the way to go because you're going to have small populations that are easy enough to trap out, especially in a lot of people say, well, I've tried traps, and we're going to discuss why trapping fails a lot of times and how to improve your, your trap success rate. Now, in this picture here, uh, now mind you, they have other types of traps beyond these two. These are just some that we pulled out of our stock and put up here so you guys get a good representation of what's on the market and what's available, uh, especially the different types. Currently, our main types of traps are going to be the old-fashioned snap traps versus the clamshell snap traps. Uh, you're going to notice we don't discuss live trapping. We're not going to discuss live trapping today, and we're not going to talk about glue boards just yet. Uh, but that is, or they are other types of trapping options too, beyond just killing traps. But we're going to start with these guys and work our way through it. And there's no such thing as a bad trap, really. It's just there's a traps are better for some situations than others, and we'll discuss which type of trap, whether you want to use a clamshell or an old-fashioned snap, and when, what situations they work best for. Uh, so let's jump into it some more. Okay, bait options. Uh, this is one of the one of the places where a lot of people uh, mess up in trapping. They put cheese on the trap. Uh, you're not going to catch anything with cheese. It, it rarely, okay? You might catch one out of every thousand. Uh, rats and mice are actually lactose intolerant. And they don't want cheese. Uh, you can use the oil-based fake cheese stuff like Cheese Whiz or something like that. And if they go to eat it, they're not going to it because it's cheese. They're going to it because it's oil-based and they want the oil from it. Uh, so already just stop baiting with cheese. It's you're going to be much more successful at other things. Uh, this was these uh, items in my basket here. I went to the grocery store and just picked up a, a handful of random items. I said, what can I buy for 20 bucks or less that I could bait traps with and be really successful? And you notice it's pretty versatile. Uh, my my options here and you can go way beyond this. We'll get into to a list of bait options and uh, more in depth in a moment. But, you know. Peanut butter, you see in the middle, that's the old go-to, right? And I am not adverse to peanut butter. The problem I have with it, though, is uh, everybody uses it. So always assume that someone tried to trap that animal before you did, and they probably used peanut butter to do it. So the animal might already have an aversion to it because these animals learn quick. So if a trap uh, springs and it, it doesn't catch them, then uh, they if they get wounded by it, they're going to learn really quick that to avoid that and they're going to remember the smell of that peanut butter and they're going to start avoiding peanut butter so that's a reason why one of the reasons why to avoid it as a bait also a lot of people nowadays wear or have peanut allergies and you never know the situation so a good solution for that use hazelnut uh hazelnut spreads uh like that work really well uh if you notice the extracts in here too uh, we'll get into how to use those. And certain animals that you're trapping for, you might want to use a different bait for. Uh, mice tend to have a, a more of a sweet tooth than rats. It's not that rats don't go to sweets. It's just that mice really have a, a thing for chocolate, we've noticed, and other sweet items. Uh, okay, good bait options here. Uh, we love to use fruits and veggies. Uh, and this is very much dependent on seasons. Think about when you're baiting too for seasonal reasons, because when you're getting to fall and winter, these animals want to put on more weight. So they're going for more uh, high protein foods and things like that. So we use a lot of bacon bits and tuna and things like that at that time of year. Uh, if you're looking at the hot months in summer, we use uh, baits that contain a lot more oil or uh, I'm sorry, a lot more moisture. So if we use tuna, we use the tuna that's in oil so it holds moisture longer. But we'll use like cucumbers and attics in August and September work really, really well because these animals are, they're very thirsty and this is something that holds moisture for a few days in a, in a hot attic. So it's something good, but think of it too, in the middle of winter, when you're in the December, January months, try using uh, apple or orange or a little bit of banana even cucumber then too, because at by that point, these animals are craving that. They've been lacking that from their diet for months at that point, so they'll go, they'll go nuts for it. Uh, the raw leaf spinach, and not the cooked spinach, but we were using raw leaf spinach and kicking butt on catching mice with it at one point. So, you know, it's, and who would think raw leaf spinach, right? It was just a, a shot in the dark. Uh, other things on this list that work, uh, chocolate syrup is great because you can put it onto your trap 
and it's hard to get off. They can't pull it off the trap. They have to lick and they have to inter interact with those trap plates and with the trap more, which increases your chance of catching it more. So, you know, that's a, a really good thing for it. Grape jelly, same deal. It leaves a residue behind. So even if a roach or an ant comes and eats that bait off, there's going to be this residue that the rats will come and try to lick off sometimes, and you, you can catch them on that second run. Uh, going to natural route, it's a little harder to bait with oats and seed and bird seed and things like this. But if you're using the type of traps that have a well, which is a little cup in there by the trip plate, you can actually place some oats or some sunflower seeds in there. Uh, vanilla extract, sesame seed oil, bacon grease, tuna juice, these are great things, but how do you put them onto a trap, right? Uh, well, we'll get into that. Okay, the use cotton string, whether you're using kite string or you're using uh, cotton yarn or something like that. And why am I saying cotton? Uh, it's, it tends to absorb stuff better. Uh, Sorry, I'm getting messages from the chat currently on my phone. I'll, I'll address them as we go. Hopefully, I'll get to them as we're going. Okay, so you take the string, and one of the cool things about the string trick is it's not only working to to uh, to catch animals with whatever you're putting on the string. It's also working for these females because before the females uh, give birth, they go into this frenzy where they're looking for nesting materials. So cotton balls and string like that, uh, they really will go for fast. But like I said, we're going to go a different, a little, uh, a step further with it. I'll cut my strings to about, uh, about four to six inches in length and then dip them into beef broth or that tuna juice or run them through some grape jelly or something. And then I put them in Ziploc bags to keep them from getting too messy. And when I go to jobs, it makes it easier because then I can just tie the string off quick to it and to my traps and, you know, keep moving. Or I can do it in advance before I even get to the job sometimes. So. Uh, just a thought. You can also keep it in glass jars or whatever if you don't like Ziplocs. But adding this, the, the string makes it much quicker to, to and makes you much more effective. And it also cuts down on having ants and roaches come and eat your bait. Uh, tying the string or applying it, like I said, you see on one side, um, on the left-hand side here, uh, this trap, I wouldn't tie like that because if the rodent approaches from behind on the back side of the trap, he'll grab the string easily and It'll set the trap off and there, you stand no chance of catching them. With the clamshell trap there with the well in it, you can just tuck the string up into that well and that's that's really good placement. You know, you don't have to secure it at all. You're just relying on the fact that the animal is going to come. But it does cut down on that advantage with the females because if you leave the ends out a little bit frayed, you're encouraging them more to come pull on it and to interact with it more. Uh, Wooden traps, it works very well too, but if you look at the one on the left, that trip plate's very big already. So if you're gonna secure on those big trip plates like that, tie to the center of the trap, uh, to the trip plate. Uh, don't tie around the entire thing like this, because yes, that, that's putting out a lot of material and that's gonna encourage the animals a lot more, but like I said, they're gonna approach to the very edge of that trip plate and pull, and that gives them a really good chance of being able to dodge it before that bar comes down and hits them. Uh, on the right-hand side, though, I love the, the smaller ones. You can still get the victors with the little smaller trip plates like that or the little smaller trip gauges. Uh, and you see how it's just a little bit of string with frayed edges? That's just about perfect. You can go and put just a one little drop of extract or one little drop of tuna juice on there for to help encourage them. Uh, I think we talked about seeding uh, in one of our other uh, earlier in the, in the last one. We definitely discussed pheromones in the first one. Uh, if you have access to a pet mouse or a rat, you could take these strings and run them through the cage or leave the, the ball of twine or string in the cage with the rat or mouse for a few days and then use that to bait to tie up your traps. Then you could be using pheromones to encourage these animals to the traps. Uh, that works as well. Okay, uh, when you're trapping, don't let corners work against you. We always teach that these animals love corners, and that's not a lie. They do like corners, uh, especially mice. Mice love to hide in corners because they can see. They can look out, and they feel secure because their back is pressed, you know, both sides are against the wall. Those guide hairs are touching the walls, and they're looking out at the world and watching. So, but you're going to see in a moment with trap placement, and I see it all the time. People put their traps out like this. They're just not thinking it through fully. Uh we're looking for lines, runs, and shadows. Uh, runs, we've discussed before, it's the, it's the paths that these animals run every day. 
their trails, their, their lines. They're leaving rub marks on it. They're leaving droppings. Uh, outside and landscaping, it's much easier to pick out runs. But inside, once you learn yeah. what you're looking for, uh, it's not that difficult to do. Uh, lines, uh, think of it like the electric lines running on the outside of building or plumbing lines running up, up and outside of building, air conditioning lines. I'm looking around my house right now looking for a line somewhere. I can't think of one in my house, but uh, cords running up a building or something like that. Uh, okay, uh, shadows, that's something key too because rodents are prey animals, so they like to hide in shadows. So look around your property or your house when you're trapping and look for those shadows and not just the ones during the day. Go out and look at night and see where you have permanent shadows, where it's dark, daytime, and nighttime. Those are going to be great places to focus your inspections on because that's going to be where these animals are going to want to hide. Uh, you should find droppings in those area, rub marks, sometimes hairs. So pay attention to stuff like that. Uh, place traps where they can be collected or at least secure them. And there's more to just securing them than the rat could run away or the trap could flip and go in a wall void. It actually comes down to the physics of how a trap works. Uh, there are holes in the back of uh, modern plastic traps so you can uh, secure the traps down. And it's actually giving more force to the trap when it springs, when it's secure. So it means you're gonna get a lethal kill on that rat. It's not gonna be able to run away and flip away and lose your trap if the trap is secure. So yeah, okay, and bring the traps to the rats. We can't rely on the animals to find these themselves. We have to put them where the animals are. So as we've talked about before with inspections and looking, once you do your good inspection, and you find all these pathways and these food and water sources and harbor spots, put the traps there. It's not so easy as to go, I'm going to put a trap every five feet and then expect to catch a rodent. If they're not in that part of the building or that part of your house or your property, that there's not going to go. There's a good chance they might never go there to investigate and find those devices. So find out, figure out where their territory is and where that home range is and put your devices in there. And more traps mean more chances. That's where a lot of people fail in trapping too. They put out uh, six traps in a, in a, in a 2000 square foot house and they're going, well, you know, I don't catch anything. Well, you have a great big property there. You're gonna probably gonna go more with the more with more than six traps easily. Uh, there is no set number for square footage or, or or linear footage for how many traps or stations and how often to put them. <clears throat> That's gonna be based on what you learn and what you see. But if you see one mouse, I hate when people say, if you see one, assume you have twelve. No, if you see one, assume you have more. That amount could vary greatly from a handful to large numbers. But if you see one rodent, assume you have more rodents. And so put out more traps. Uh, it is not advancing. No. no. Okay, it advanced now. Yes. Okay. Okay, now, uh, see, this is how the corners work against you. Placing a trap like this, the rodent can approach from two ways. Unless you're really positive and using your cameras and really been doing your surveillance and know that they're only going to come from one direction every time, which is really weird, this is going to work against you because sometimes the animals will come from the back end and then you won't catch the animal. So also a lot of times when they get to these corners, they know the corner's there. So they're slowing down because they want to sit in that corner and, and scope out what's going on. So if you were counting on this animal coming full speed like they normally do in their runs, that's not going to happen as much with corners. That's one of those times where they slow down tremendously. So they're going to realize something's in their path. So don't let that work against you like that. Uh, okay, another way trapping goes wrong. Uh, this looks good, but it's not. Uh, they have both in this situation, the back end of the, of the trap or to the wall. You always want to put the end of the trap that's going to catch the animal in a trip plate facing the wall. This cuts back on reaction time from the rodent, so he can't turn his head because there's a wall blocking him. So he'll be forced to go to get go forward still and look forward or, you know, get a glancing blow enough to kill him good uh, or to get a lethal hit on him. Uh, see, this would be almost ideal, but it's still not quite perfect because you look at it and yes, we have both of our set our traps now facing the correct way to get kill shots. We have both of them in the wall facing uh, so that, you know, we're cutting down on the animal's reaction time. But what's going to happen? Uh, it's quite likely when the animal hits one of these traps, the force of this trap, if it's not secure, if these traps were secure, this is perfect. If they're not secure, 
that trap's going to flip with the animal in it, and you're going to catch it twice in both traps, which cuts down on your chance of catching more animals, which also, uh, you know, it's just not effective. You don't need to catch a rat twice. Once is good enough. So a way to get around this if you're not securing your traps, just pull them out a few inches more. If we If each trap was pulled six inches more away from each other, that would give enough room so that when the animal is caught, even if he did a flip or a tumble set in a trap, you would probably have enough room so you wouldn't – or you definitely cut down on that chance of catching the animal twice. So like I said, don't let these corners work against us when we're trapping. Uh, this is a quick and easy trapping trick, actually. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about pre-baiting in a second, I guess. Uh, but this is the quick and easy pre-bait trick here. Uh, this is not the the real way you want to do it. This is if you're in a hurry and it doesn't always work, but it works sometimes. You take the two traps on the left and the right here, uh, the two wooden traps, you would bait these traps and set them not to snap. You don't want to set them hot. You want to you want to teach this animal. I should have let in with that and what pre-baiting is, but we'll get to that in a second. But set these traps right here with bait in them. So when the animals come up to them, they go, oh, wow, free food. The you're trying to make it so that they're the last thing they expect is that middle trap there to be set hot. You're going to have it baited too. So no matter which direction they're coming from, they're finding a free little meal. It's decreasing that trap shyness and that neophobia and getting them more used to the option of going to the middle to eat. This is also really cool because with mice, when you do this trick, a lot of times when something new is in a mouse's way before he investigates, he'll just jump it out of instinct. And I've seen mice come up to these and go up to either the left or right trap. And even though it's full of food, they didn't care. They thought they could clear it jumping, and they jumped directly into the middle trap. So, uh, yeah, sometimes it works out in your advantage in a way you never expected. Uh, another key thing for trap placement, we're talking about lines. Here's a good example. While this isn't exactly what we're talking about with lines, this works well. Uh, you can zip tie traps to pipes, guys. Everybody has like an electric line outside their house or something like that, or like I said, an AC line. Uh, we can zip tie these traps to them easily, set them to snap. And if you know that these animals are going up and down, if they're sebum marks or urine marks, or if it's an AC line, a lot of times uh, roof rats, they leave these claw marks from where they're climbing up and down. It almost looks like something tore away at it, which they, that's exactly what's happening. Your claws are tearing away from all the trips up and down that pipe. Zip tie these traps to it. and a lot of times you'll catch the animal, especially on the up and down pipes, you'll catch these guys on momentum alone because it's really hard on their way down for them to stop when, when a new item's in their way and they'll get caught quick and easy like that. But on these as well, it's easy to catch these guys sometimes even without bait because they're so used to running these pipes that they're not going to think that something's going to be new and in their way. Uh, I love that placement. That's a great one. See, uh, this is great, too, because when the animal's running, he doesn't really see anything in his way. He's running and going straight forward. The snap trap leaves an open view. And when you get to this one, to the clamshell style trap, uh, when he gets to it, he's just going to see dark in front of him. So that's going to confuse him because he wants to see open air in front of him. He doesn't see black in front of him. is really going to confuse him. So he's probably going to go up and over that trap. And if he's running the other way, all you did was give him a ramp so he can run and jump and go wee onto the pipe and keep going. Uh, so, like I said, clamshell traps are great against a wall, like we were showing earlier with the other traps, uh, because that clamshell trap cuts down on the fact that the animals can't approach from behind at all. If you're trapping walls, go with the clamshell trap design, because like I said, that cuts down on any of that behind uh, approach. If you're trapping on a line or a pipe, you're going to want an open-ended trap so the animals can see through. Uh, it will definitely increase your trap success rate using those tips. Okay, trap placement. For a long time, we did teach that they should be against the walls and in corners. And now the more we're looking at it, actually, how the animals are interacting with our traps in the actual wild and in the field, uh, we were wrong in a lot of these cases. And this is one of my sites where I was working. Now this has been years ago, but uh, this was when we first started working with game cameras. So if you look close, you can see I've got, I want to say, five or six cameras out in this in this picture alone. Uh, mixed in with all these traps, and I'm in an attic of a building. It was infested with rats, uh, and it wasn't their fault so much. This was a clean building. Uh, they didn't realize the building had a gap in a foundation where there was an actual hole in the ground, two floors down, where the rats were burrowing and coming up straight through the hole in the wall, and the rats would travel up to the second floor and climb, climb up between the brick walls of these two buildings in this little tiny gap that had occurred over the years in it, and 
they were getting all the access from the second floor. And from there, they were going down into the actual shop. But if you look in here, you can see my traps are pretty varied in their placement. And it was because of the fact that I was able to watch these rats every night and see where they were running and where they were going. I didn't have rhyme or reason to why they took those paths, but they took some really weird paths that didn't involve corners or lines or walls or anything like that. They had pretty much free reign of this attic. Uh, the arrows pointing to one of the holes I was talking about that dropped down two floors. Eventually, I had to funnel concrete down this gap to seal that hole. That was the only way to stop this rat problem permanently. It took exclusion, and then I had to trap out all the animals that were left. And uh, over six months, I pulled over 139 animals out of it. I was looking at my notes yesterday going, wow, I really did. This was a heck of a job. But uh, and earlier we were uh, before this all star clutter and I was we're discussing whether or not to include the death shots in here because the first rat I caught came out of this hole directly into that trap. Uh, it wasn't the bait that caught him, actually. It was the placement of the trap and knowing that he had no option but to jump there. Uh, now, mind you, I caught a lot with bait in this attic, but not using that way. Uh, here's a method we talked about corners. But if you look, you can see these traps are in corners, but. That gap in that attic and that, that sill right there, uh, that was almost a nine inch sill. So the rats were having to lean over to feed out of the traps. They hadn't figured out they could just jump onto the ceiling and walk. They were walking and hanging over. So a lot of the rats, I call it, they would fall over into the trap based on their own weight. They were leaning over and trying not to set the trap off and eating. That was the other problem. In this attic, it was full of trap shy rodents. These guys had been, uh, many people had come before me to, to attempt to trap these guys out. So these animals had learned to be afraid of traps. Uh, do we even discuss pre-baiting in this one? Let's see, we'll keep going and see if it happens. Okay, the one that got away, guys, this is something we see all the time too that people overlook because as Claudia had mentioned, we're being detectives. We're looking for that fine little detail that these animals left behind because they're little animals. Uh, when you find that blood spot, either on your trap or in the area of the trap, start looking. Usually within six to 10 feet of you, you're gonna find a dead rodent. Uh, it's a very good sign that you got that that you you were able to get a lethal a lethal shot. Uh, so when you find blood spots on your traps, start looking for the animals. Okay, isn't this an awesome picture? I love this. Uh, this is some uh, talk about eye for detail. It's easy to pick out where the rat ate on the food, right? We can even see scrape the cup a little bit with his teeth at one point. But you see how close we got to catching it when I say missed by a hair? That's a vibrissi that those arrows are pointing at there, stuck to the trap. Now, uh, this is a great lead in the pre-baiting, actually, so this will work perfect, guys. Uh, we discussed vibrissi last week, right? They're very sensitive uh, sensory organ on those rats. It's the equivalency of a finger, okay? So if someone pulled your finger off of you, you would remember that person the rest of your life. You would probably avoid that person the rest of your life, too, at the chance of maybe losing another finger to them. Well, if you, that rat lost a vibrissi to that trap, is he ever going to go near that trap again? Probably not. It's going to take a lot to convince him to go near the trap because now he's he going to remember that that trap pulled, it hurt him badly one day. He's going to remember that pain and associate it with it. Now, the other problem is he's going to associate the pain with peanut butter. Because, like I said, that was a near miss. That was enough to yank a finger off. So how do we get around this? Okay, uh, if we have any hunters in the audience or anybody from Marywood Hunting, we're going to use the, the method of, of the deer hunters and pig hunters and other hunters use. We're going we're gonna to train these animals like you would a dog or anything else, too. Uh, we're going to put feeders out. We're going to turn our traps from lethal devices to training devices where we put them out and we don't set them to snap. OK, there's been studies done on this over the years, and uh, I repeated the study years ago, too, and we showed that it takes three to four days to train a rat to get over its trap shyness, to get over that fear of these traps that has been ingrained in them. Even using the bait that taught them that fear, using peanut butter that we were able to, to teach the rat to get over it. And it, like I said, three to four days, you can increase your trap rate. I want to say we got to about 65 to 70 percent increase in trap rate just from pre-baiting for three or four days. And it seems labor intensive, and it can be. But if you're in a house, like I said, we're thinking about this from a homeowner's perspective. So you might be running two dozen traps at your house to three dozen traps. That's not that hard to go and monitor every day and rebate as needed. Uh, <clears throat> but you're going to notice 
wait till you see 75 to 85 percent of those traps cleaned out when you get to that level then set the traps to snap and instead of catching one or two mice or rats every day you're going to catch you're going to catch substantially more you're going to catch you know larger amounts i can't give you an exact number but believe me your success will go up greatly um and it's worth the effort you know you've taught these animals hey this is your best friend this trap and the last thing they're expecting is after five days their best friend suddenly becomes their worst enemy so it's and it's so easy to teach them okay if you're trapping outdoors and you're trapping near burrows this is a mistake uh not trapping near burrows but the placement in these pictures is a mistake okay when you look at norway rats and you watch them when they come out the burrow the first thing you see pop outs in those and they they look around and you see the low vibrissy move and they're sniffing they're smelling around so they're going to smell that bait and all that but it's going to be kind of suspicious think of it like this if someone put a cheeseburger in your front door uh, on your doorstep or a pizza on your doorstep and you weren't expecting it would you eat it would you take it inside with you no you'd probably be pretty suspicious about it. sorry guys uh someone just shot a gun in my house uh okay uh that really threw me off uh okay yeah if someone put a cheeseburger or pizza in, front, in your doorway hush leia uh you would be suspicious of it and you wouldn't take it and eat it you would push it away or you'd go around it and that's what these rodents are going to do in this situation uh pull the traps back a little bit give them that chance to come out sniff and make sure the coast is clear and then they'll come out and the great thing is if you're trapping like this uh you can see the hole in the back uh there's a hole back at the end of this trail here at the end of this run uh pull your traps out about a foot or two from that hole and then put them in the run because once they know that the coast is clear they're going to come out running full blast out those holes because they're like i said we've said before on those runs they've urinated and defecated and left pheromone markers on those trails so that they're able to run them easily without needing to slow down uh and place your traps like this if you notice in the last picture the way the traps were placed you're not standing a chance if the animal comes from certain directions uh this greatly increases your chances right here uh putting them like this and when you catch it you're going to catch the animal like this which means you got a beautiful instant kill on the animal there's no chance of him escaping from the trap uh it worked out great guys i apologize for my dog someone keeps shooting a gun behind my house and it's driving my dog crazy uh okay pre baiting uh which i just went into in depth and didn't know we we're gonna get the pictures for it well uh we'll go over it a little bit more okay the rats come out every day and they go and explore the, they're explore and re-explore uh their environment uh they want to get to know things so when new things are placed out like i said like that cheeseburger that hamburger they're gonna be a little leery of this because in nature real food just doesn't show up out of nowhere they have to go out looking and foraging for it uh, so it takes them a little while to get uh, comfortable with it but it's worth the effort oh questions we're going to get before i'll answer that we didn't include in here before they get asked uh what happens what do you do with the cat traps after you kill the rodent in them uh guys rats they don't understand like we do that they're going to die one day they have no concept of death so and while we talked about how great of families they have and how great they are to each other and their siblings uh sometimes once they're dead they see this as a food opportunity they don't see it as mom dad brother sister they see it as ooh free buffet and this clicks as instant as the next one next to them getting killed in a trap because a lot of times we'll see this where you know siblings feeding on each other no more than 30 seconds ago they were playing uh so don't think of the trap as the death trap as something that's going to deter rats actually and also that animal urinated and defecated when it killed so he left a pheromone mark near the trap and it happened people say well is it a distress marker it happened so quick no it's not going to be like that it's just going to be a mark uh but you will notice a, a greater success rate in your dirty traps uh trap shyness we've discussed too and that's something that occurs from these animals encountering the trap and not getting killed or it occurs naturally uh just from neophobia from where the the fact that they're leery of anything new that's placed into their environment uh when pre-baiting tips for it a lot goes a long way when you're starting 
we we put a ton of bait on our traps when we're pre-baiting uh, and we go back every day to make sure it's there because like i said we want to teach these animals to come back every day and if you look on the cameras they'll learn your timing and they'll, a lot of times they'll figure out hey you know they'll be there 15 minutes after you left from baiting because they they figured out the schedule that you're on uh when you actually go to trap though you want to put as little bait as possible because you've already taught these animals that the trap is their friend they already know there's going to be food there but if you only put a little bit toward the in the middle of the catch tra uh the the catch plate or the trap plate that encourages them and uh is going to increase their them having to interact with the trap and like i said always remove your dead rodents quickly from the traps because you don't need another food source and that's what it's going to provide Here's a good example of what I'm talking about. Pre-baiting, fill that cup up. When you're actually active baiting, fill it halfway so the animal actually has to lean in to feed out of it. Uh, now we're going to move to our denicides. Now, guys, because this is for homeowners, this is just going to be sort of an overview of redenicides in a sense. So you guys have a better idea of what your pest control guys are doing when they're using redenicides on your property. And uh, if you do choose to use redenicides on your property, uh we'll get into it but there are very strict rules for doing this and there's reasons for it and we're going to get into that too uh now basically we have two basic types of rodent well actually we have multiple now but the most commonly used rodenticide that you're going to come across are going to be second generation anticoagulants there are first generations like warfarin that are still out there but there are serious resistant issues in rodent populations to first generation anticoagulants uh, plus, they tend to learn quicker that that poison is hurting them, so they avoid them quicker. Uh, that's why we now are using more second-generation anticoagulants. They're multi-feed baits, which make them less toxic to non-targets as well, which means this animal has to go and feed multiple times. It can get enough to kill it on the first go, but it's going to kill it at a slower rate so the animal isn't able to realize that the poison's killing it. If a rodent eats something and it makes it sick, the rodent will, will realize that and go, oh, I'm not going to eat that anymore. And then you'll get what's called bait avoidance. So modern chemicals are designed to avoid bait avoidance issues. Uh, there are non-anticoagulants, uh, non bromethylin, which is a neurotox uh, nerve toxin, uh, calciferol, which causes vitamin uh, D deficiencies, uh, zinc phosphide. Uh, it's actually uh, not a bad chemical. It's just very dangerous to birds and other to some other a few other non-targets. And carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide are things we're going to talk about today too that we use. Okay, yeah, a few years back, the EPA decided to uh, tighten restrictions on rodenticides for everybody, uh, for not just our industry but for also homeowners. So for more specifics on this, you can go to the website listed at the bottom, and it'll give you an exact listing of everything. But the important thing is to get from this, it's your responsibility if you're a homeowner to look up these rules and regs and to read them and understand them because you are as responsible when you're using these rodenticides as a pest control guy. Meaning if you target, if you poison a non-target creature, you are just as liable. Okay, so if you kill something with this poison, which is not as hard as you think if you did, if you use it incorrectly, uh, that would be your problem. You know, you could stay and do jail time or get a serious fine. So take it seriously, because that's something we see all the time where people go and buy over the counter rodenticides and don't listen to the label and they put themselves, their family, their neighbors, their pets at risk. And I said, I'm not anti rodenticide at all. I'm just anti the misuse of rodenticides. So, okay, tamper resistant bait stations, guys. And yes, I'm aware that decon is still available on the market, but we're not here to debate decon and the uses of it and whether or not it should still be available on the market. Uh, but always, always, always read that label first. Uh, and this goes for if we have industry people working as well as homeowners, read the label first because every bait is going to have a different application rate, the amount that you should put down. Every bait might have one or two lines. Don't use this near water. Use this wherever. Uh, can't be used outdoors. Must be used indoors. It's going to have all kinds of specifics on it that you're going to need. Uh, always maintain a supply of fresh bait. Uh, some of these tips are for uh, uh, pest control operators, so we won't go into them so much. Uh, placing, placement is key, just like with traps, with stations as well. Also monitoring them, okay? You can't go with a three-month monitoring plan for bait stations. It has to be at least monthly or more often uh, because you have to make sure there's bait in the stations. Uh, and only put them where you need them. 
don't put them every 10 or 15 feet because it's just that's unnecessary only in areas where you have activity uh incorrect station placement it leads to other issues as well you can get ants roaches uh snails and slugs also the all these animals eat bait and it has no effect on them whatsoever it doesn't kill them they can be happy and healthy and reproduce with no problems uh stations need to be anchored or secured anchored to the ground means they drill a hole in and put an anchor in that station it's not permanently there but it, it's it's there for a long time secured means the kind of stations with the bricks on them they have to be five pounds or better the bricks that are, are attached to the bottom they are removable uh, if you're indoors, you don't need to anchor or secure them, but any outdoor station must be anchored or secured. Now, these placements, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the holes for the entry point are actually on the right hand. We're looking at the picture on the left. The holes are on the right hand of that station. So if you were going to place it, you want to place it along the wall, right? <clears throat> Unless you knew for sure the rats, that was their running path, you were going for the wall with this. So he'd have to flip his station around. Uh, the other one in the middle there, maybe there's a rat run there, but there isn't. There's no evidence to show that. This was just a station placed out because the people were in a hurry. Uh, the other issue is uh, there's no labeling on the station. So if there was a non-target, be it a child or an animal poisoning issue, without any labeling on that station, a company name or phone number to contact, we'd be in serious trouble if we had a poisoning issue. So those stations have to be labeled to put out. Uh, Station placement. Okay, and this is an indoor station, so it doesn't need to be anchored, but is this good placement? Uh, this is a yes and no. This is some of the greatest horrible placement you'll ever see, actually. Uh, and I'll own my own mistake. I put this station out. Uh, the rats were running the pipe. I put it up there, and it, it wedged. I didn't even have to secure it with anything. It was like a perfect spot for the station. The rats ran right in and started eating bait the first day. What's the problem? How did I fail? Guess what rained out of that station while the rats were in there eating? Yep, rat droppings and bits of bait rained down into that candy. And while the candy was secure in bags, it still had to be in the best interest of public health. It was all destroyed and removed. So, yes, even I make mistakes. If I'd have moved all that candy out the way, would the station placement be good? Yeah, it would be great. It's high enough so children can't get to it, so pets can't get to it. You could put a garbage can underneath to catch anything that fell or any debris that fell underneath from the rats feeding in it. So, you know, it's just going the extra mile and looking at the big picture and not saying good enough. You know, sometimes we have to look closer at our own work. Uh, station strategy, we'll skip this one real quick. Oh, no, we're going to point out one little thing in this one real quick, and because this is really a pest control operator slide. Uh, if you guys can make it out, all these little white specks on the station, I'm not sure if you can see that the shininess on that red rodenticide right there, uh, that's snails, what it looks like when snails have been feeding on rodenticide, actually. So just a little extra bonus for you guys. More station strategy, more for pest control guys, but I will comment on this. There are some really neat things on the market. They're uh, non-toxic rodenticides, and they have markers in them. They have these things that cause the... Uh, the droppings in a urine to uh, to glow when you shine a UV light on them. Uh, they shine out very well. So if you're looking to track these animals back to what their food source is and water source is or where they're, where they're living at, this is ideal for that. And it's also really good because we'll use it to prime stations. We'll get mice and rats feeding on this non-toxic bait, which seems to be a lot more palatable to them, and then swap it out for the toxic baits. And it works out really well for us. Okay, we, I mentioned earlier, those holes on that station, the entry point, should be against the walls. Otherwise, the rat's just going to, he's not going to go looking for it. And he go, well, they'll smell the bait inside and go to it. Not so much, okay? They're really drawn to the stations because we mentioned earlier shadows, because it's dark inside. And they want to go see what's in this little dark spot. Can I hide in there? Can I sleep? And then they find the food and go, oh, bonus. Uh, and at the bottom, we have this cool thing. This is a monitoring device with a glue board inside of it. Uh, like I said, we'll talk more about glue boards in a future presentation. But if you're going to use glue boards anywhere, I would always use them in devices like this, be it a tin cat or one. This is a trapper or whatever. Um, not to name products, sorry. But certain devices that secure the, the glue board basically in there. So if anybody here has ever used a glue board and had to get stuck to a floor or God help you get stuck to a person, you know how miserable it is to remove these glue boards from anything. Sometimes it's almost impossible. 
I like it. Uh, one time we called the manufacturer and to see if there was any solvent or something to to use on the glue, and they just started laughing. Uh, <laughs> no, that's not the point. The point is to, that it's really sticky. You know, you think they'd make a remover, but oh well. Uh, okay, pellet baiting, guys. This is one for only licensed professionals. When you give us a call and we come out to your property. This is one of the services we'll do if we find active and only if we find active rat burrows. That's something in South Louisiana, a lot of times we get what are called crawfish holes, which that's exactly what they are. Uh, they are crawfish holes, but they get mistaken for rat burrows. So uh, we don't just dump pellet bait down any hole. It has to be a rat burrow. And we know the, the criteria for what, how to determine if it's an active rat burrow or not. But this is done using tubing where we pump, put the tubing in there and it, there's an art to burrow baiting because you have to be very careful and very well practiced at it because you're you're trying not to collapse a hole that has it's not like rats have discovered uh structural support beams or how to build buttresses so there's nothing in there holding that hole together and we have very sandy alluvial soil so it's very easy to cause a collapse you have to be very careful uh be careful not to overbait and be careful if you collapse the burrows because these guys do housekeeping everyday norway rats so they're going to come and they're going to kick all that poison out, like you see in the bottom picture, all over the place on the ground. So now birds can get it. Children get it. It's a pretty purple color. It looks like candy. You know, so this could be a real bit bad issue. Uh, the other thing with the overbaiting, like I said, it's like shoving someone's front door full of cheeseburgers and expecting them to eat their way through the cheeseburgers. They're not going to do it. No, no one's going to do that. They're just going to push them out of the way. Uh Okay, CO2. Uh, the advantages of CO2, everything has its advantages and disadvantages. One of the cool advantages, fast, or some of the cool advantages, fast, no residual. Uh, traditional pesticides aren't being used, so uh, it's more of a green chemical, if you would, because CO2 is literally, we exhale it every time we breathe. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's kind of necessary for life. Uh, and it can, it's very versatile. Oh, also, it's cool because it kills the insects. Uh, if you're having to deal with Bartonella and Leptospirosis, these are uh, rodent-borne diseases. They're also transmitted by a flea. You're going to want to kill all those insects, especially if you're doing a large kill-off of animals, because as soon as the body start getting cold, the fleas and mites and ticks start getting off of them. So the CO2 is great for helping uh, limit that. Oh, and here's some pictures of our guys. Oh, you have to currently there's only one distributor for co2 or one uh company that holds the label for co2 it's bell labs you have to get a label from them and this is for professionals only this is not a homeowner thing guys like i said everyone is responsible and everyone is expected to follow these rules if you go and buy dry ice on your own and try and do this on your own property you are breaking the law in fact you're breaking the federal law so I would not recommend it. And don't be surprised if someone calls in on you when they see your ground smoking and a, a, a state inspector shows up and writes you a ticket. You know, because like I said, these are things for us only. Uh, and while we're bragging about how safe and green it is, it involves some training and involves being very careful. That stuff is so cold, it actually causes burns on you. Uh, you have to wear special gloves to handle it. Uh, like I said, this is... As easy as it sounds, there is a lot of technical to it. Uh, that's us applying it, putting it in, wearing those minus 60 gloves. Uh, and guys, it takes, okay, it's supposed to be, whoops, it's supposed to be two pounds per burrow. Uh, that doesn't mean that you have to be two pounds per burrow. Uh, I have, can somebody please mute their mic for me? Okay. Uh, it says two pounds per burrow, but it's not easy to fit two pounds per burrow always. So that doesn't mean that you have to use two pounds per burrow. That means the max you can use. If less is required to do that burrow system or that burrow, that's okay. Just, you can't go over that. Okay. Uh, cool thing too. Look, if you look right here in the center of the picture, that little brown cluster there, guys, that's American cockroaches fleeing the burrow system because the rats also share their burrow system with a lot of little bug pests. So as we said, it's also really cool because it's killing our insect pests as well. Okay, and we'll go to Claudia for a summary.
issues? I just did. <clears throat> Timmy and Claudia are trying to work out some technical difficulties and share their screens with each other. I just want to remind everyone while we're waiting that if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box and I'll get to them. Also, I added some documents that you might find helpful in the chat box as far as what to look around your house, like to see if you may have a rodent issue. Um, also reminded that if you're in the city of New Orleans, you can dial 311 to contact us and request an inspector to come out and inspect your property if you suspect that you have a rat problem. All right, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, All right, sorry about that. OK, so we covered a lot of things today, right? From conducive conditions and a lot of these different integrated rodent management strategies. And so look, for in order to have a long-term sustainable control, you really need to look at the variety of things that you can do to help manage. It's more than just that one thing. So it's very, very important. So I really encourage all the residents and people who have got commercial accounts to take a, you know, do that walk around, see what might be contributing to the issues of that property. It's very difficult to do everything at one time. So pick the low hanging fruit, right? And just work towards fixing the problems. And so it will help. You know, these animals explore and re-explore their surroundings all the time. So, and in some cases they will move quite a long distance. And so the rats may not even be in your yard nesting. They may be coming from somewhere else. So do everything that you possibly can do to make an unfavorable environment there. Uh, Timmy talked a lot about pre-baiting. That's something that we do all the time. And we really are encouraging our homeowners to do the same. And so they can be wary of these new foods and new objects. So snap trapping, if you don't wanna do it yourself, call a pest control professional, they'll do it. But you know, I think we've provided some of the tools that you can actually do yourself. And so get that tool, which is the snap trap, get them used to it as the feeding center. And then you're able to, um, to you know, deploy those uh, and be successful. And bring the trap to the rat or to the mouse. We really need that. Sanitation, regardless of all these strategies, that is the main and most important thing when it pertains to rodent control. So, and the sanitation part really has to do with removal of the food source. If you remove the food source, these animals become stressed, they start fighting amongst each other, and that's gonna help as well with the decline. So anyway, so look, thank you everybody. I think I was trying to answer some of these questions in the chat box as we were going. Uh, Richard, so we talked, uh, the wee poles, we're gonna talk a lot about pest proofing next week. I don't, we don't really find that they enter, mice are entering wee poles uh, a whole lot, but you can have other pest issues from wee poles as well. So what you can do is add some screen, cut a piece of screen lengthwise, like a rectangle, you can uh, curl it up and shove it into your weep holes. So I think that would be good. All right, another one is compost piles, right? So that is just an uh, available food source for these rats and mice. So we're not against compost piles, but when you do a compost pile, you have to do it correctly. And so what you don't wanna do is just pile a bunch of banana peels and fruit right at the top and just leave it because that is available food. So follow proper composting procedures. And that typically is going to involve that layering of soil or some leaf debris, something on top of that food so that it can build, uh, decompose. And so with compost piles, there's constant turning and working into it so everything breaks down and that can be reutilized in your garden or wherever it may be. So 
Composting is a good thing because it helps remove some of that trash a potential, you know, into the, the system, into the landfill. So just make sure you're following, um, you know, proper composting procedures. All right, I think that is it for any other questions. Is anybody, um, you can remove your mute, I guess. And um, if there, anybody has any questions, please let us know. All right, well, look, thank you everybody for taking the time. Um, and I think, you know, the main thing here is uh, we really appreciate everybody's time coming in. We're hoping that these are useful for everybody. We'll be posting uh, these webinars on our website. If you're in Orleans Parish and you have any kind of rodent issues, please call 311. We typically do not go inside the home. That really is for the professional market. Uh, but of course, you know, if you have any issues that you want to discuss or we can always provide information, but we do inspect yards and provide information that you may need. And um, please email any comments to bugshop at nola.gov. Any of the traps, any of the stations, rodenticides, this is strictly for educational purposes only. We're not endorsing one product or the other. And, um, and of course this presentation, once it's posted, is strictly for educational purpose only. All right, this is our contact information. Uh, please feel free to email us or you know call us through 311 at any time or our office. We're always available. And again, the next one we're going to skip a couple of weeks because of the holidays, but December 5th we're going to be talking all about pest proofing. A lot of these are going to be um, you know uh, products that you can buy over the counter and there's also going to be some professional products but it's all about closing uh, your structure and keeping these animals out. All right, um, we had one question here at the end. Um, if we could just, uh, oh, oh, somebody's in Guam watching. So fantastic, welcome Rosanna. Uh, but we can look at the time. We're trying to find a time that's uh, good for everybody. So this is why we moved it to the weekend. But if you feel as during the week is better for everybody, just please let us know your comments and um, we're happy to move them. All right, everyone, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much for taking the time.